Welcome to Days of Roar, a Detroit Tiger podcast brought to you by the Detroit Free Press. My name is Mark Gorash. I am here with Free Press beat writer Evan Petzold in the Thanksgiving edition of Days of Roar. What's up, Ab? Busy week. Busy week. A lot of 40-man roster moves. It has uh, been an interesting one for sure. So there's a lot going on. Probably should just jump right into it. Yeah, let's go. This week, non-tender deadline, 40-man roster deadline. Tigers made some moves. Let's try to walk through them. Pretty much did almost exactly what we thought they would do. I did think they would put Austin Meadows on the restricted list. You can maybe get into that in a minute. But let's get into question one of the big two. Who did the Tigers protect and why? Who did they leave exposed? Eb, share with us a little bit about the decision-making and who's now on the 40-man who didn't make it. Yeah, I was really interested to see how this was going to go down. The deadline was Tuesday, and that's when teams have to protect you know, eligible players from being selected in the Rule 5 draft. That's how the Tigers got Akil Badu. That's how they got Mason Engler. So there are certain players that are eligible for this Rule 5 draft. I'm not really going to get into that because, I mean, it's super complicated and can kind of be a mouthful at that point. But the point is, is there were a lot of players that are eligible in the minor league system. The Tigers protected right-hander Wilmer Flores and catcher Dylan Dingler. Those are the two that everyone expected them to, you know, protect. I don't think those were shockers by any means. The question was, hey, look, if they're going to protect those two guys, could there be a third? Could there be a fourth that they want to protect? I mean, you go back to last offseason, there was a whole handful of players the Tigers protected. Well, everybody knew Wilmer Flores and Dylan Dinger were going to get protected. That was no surprise at all. Flores is the Tigers' number seven prospect in MLB pipeline. Dingler is number 11. But the question was, what about Andrew Magno? A left-hander, comes out of the bullpen. He's got pretty good stuff, but the command's not great. How about Trey Cruz, who plays infield, outfield? He's a switch hitter. He's got a little bit of power that's been developing recently. He's got really good plate discipline, can run a little bit. How about Will Kel Hernandez, a guy who you know got dinged up and, and he missed the 2020 season because of COVID and then had the Tommy John surgery, but he comes back and he's got a pretty good fastball. Secondary pitches are shaky and, and questionable. And then what about out for the Roberto Campos, a player the Tigers spent $2.85 million on in the international market to go and, and get him a while back. And he's had mediocre results so far, but you know the upside obviously is there. You don't pay that much money for a guy and you see the raw tools. You know that he's worth that coming out of the international market. And the question then becomes, hey, can you develop him? So far, he hasn't really developed into much, but the upside is there where if a team could stash him for a year, maybe they're able to then send him back to the minor leagues and get him back into his development and and see what they get. Again, Roberto Campos, probably a stretch. But Andrew Magno, Trey Cruz, those are two names that made a lot of sense to me. And that was the biggest surprise, that they didn't protect more than just Wilmer Flores and Dylan Dingler. Now, maybe rightfully so, because you know the Rule 5 draft, draft could come around and no teams could pick up those players. And that could be a totally justified decision. But I'll be interested to see, especially Andrew Magno. I think the stuff is really, really good. The command, not so much. Which is pretty common for left-handers. I mean, it's not like he throws excessively hard. But he's, he's mid-90s. You know, 93, mid-90s. 93, 93-95. And he had a very good year at Erie. So I think the attitude about most major league teams these days is so many more players are not added to the 40 or non-tendered that the caliber of available player, there, there's more fringy, projectable players available in the secondary market because not only is Andrew Magno available, but there's probably 23 Andrew Magnus Magnos available now in baseball that the Tigers can claim or add from other teams where they were not added. They could rule five them or they were not tendered and they can just sign them, you know, whether it's to the 40 or as a minor league free agent. So I, I think that, you know, in olden, olden days or, you know, in past years, the Tigers may have been more aggressive but now I just think the way the game's played and over 50% of players are on major league minimum contracts that there's just a lot more fringy type of players available. So guys like this, they don't worry about losing if in fact they were to lose them. No, I, 
I agree. And, and and that's the thing, Mark, is they could go out and they could go into the Rule 5 draft and they could get an Andrew Magno if at that point, you know, they needed somebody. Or they could simply just add him to the 40-man roster if he ends up making it through and, and ends up in spring training and maybe he's really good and they want to add him and that's great. They can do that then. And, he, and again, the way that the Rule 5 draft works, just so everybody understands, is the Rule 5 draft is scheduled for December 6th it's at the winter meetings in Nashville, Tennessee. And the way that it works is teams can choose to select an eligible unprotected player from another team, so like an Andrew Magno, for $100,000. And a player picked in the Rule 5 draft needs to stay on that team's 26-man roster or the injured list for the entire 2024 season. If they're removed from the roster, the player is placed on waivers, has to go through waivers, and then if clearing waivers, gets offered back to their original team for $50,000. So in a, in, a, in a world, right, like Andrew Magno could get picked up by a different team, that team could get to the end of spring training and say, yeah, you know what? This isn't going to work. We're going to put you back on waivers. If you clear, Tigers can get him back for, you know, $50,000, right? So like there is a way to get these players back. I mean, the Tigers got Will Vest back. I mean, that that's how Will Vest, you know, returned to the Tigers bullpen and became a key piece for them was he was picked up in the Rule 5 draft, got returned, and then ended up getting his opportunity and running with it. So those kind of things happen all the time. He actually got returned in the middle of the season. Mm-hmm. So which which that can happen too. I mean, again, if you're gonna hold on to a guy for that long, you probably wanna, you know, hold on to him and push the rest of the way. But at the same time, if you're a postseason team and you're planning to go to the, the the playoffs, right? Like, you know, there might be a better arm for you in the minor leagues and you don't really have space for that one player, so you just have to send him back. That kind of stuff happens all the time. So there's a little bit of concern about rule five draft and losing players, but at the same time, you know, more often than not, they do get returned. I, I do want to tip the cap to the Tigers for, you know, holding on to a guy like Mason Engler to being able to hold on to Akil Badu. They held on to Ronnie Garcia. Like the, the list goes on and on of players that the Tigers have been able to hold on to. Victor Reyes is another example. So I do appreciate when teams, and I know we'll say what you want about Victor Reyes, but I appreciate when teams pick up rule five guys and then they stick with them and they see if they can develop them. I think that means something. Well, listen, shout out to the, you know, the duo of Vic Reyes and Roni Garcia. They kind of give me whiplash, reminding me of when we were losing 98 games for many consecutive seasons. And, you know, look, Vic Reyes hit, I think, 20 homers in AAA this year. And, uh, you know, his power is emerging. The rumor is when he's thir- 33 <laughs> years old, 33 Stop years it. old, that I think in the KBO, he probably will he'll hit 25 dogs. So I, I learned quickly when I got on the beat that the Victor Reyes, you know, launch angle spring training story was like a real thing. And that was pretty much just like on repeat year after year, you know, seeing if Vic Reyes could get to the the launch angle and get to the pole and be able to do some damage with 20 plus homers. And it never happened. But Mark, I do want to ask you real quick, what you think about the two players that the Tigers did add. You've gotten to watch them a couple of times, you know, during the season, obviously you follow videos of their stars, but Wilmer Flores, Dylan Dingler, what, what are kind of some of your thoughts? Because when I look at Wilmer Flores, I say, okay, this guy can either be a really good starting pitcher or a really good relief pitcher. He has four pitches, the four seam fastball, the slider, the curveball, and the changeup. The changeup hasn't come along yet. I think he needs that pitch to really be a frontline type starter. I think he can maybe be like a fifth starter without that changeup, maybe. But he could definitely be a high leverage reliever even without the changeup. But that changeup seems like the X factor to me. The fastball sits at 93 miles an hour, generates swings and misses. I think that's a positive sign. Like when you have a fastball that misses bats, that's pretty rare and something that you're going to need when you get to the big leagues. Likes to throw the slider in the strike zone for weak contact, throws his curveball outside the strike zone and leverage counts for strikeouts. The changeup, like I said, is just like the weakest pitch and, and needs to be developed. Where are you at with Wilmer Flores? Can he be a starter? Do you think he's a reliever? Or is he stuck somewhere in between? I think he's going to have to improve quite a bit to be a starter. I think right now I see him as a reliever. But at the same time, I now have, you know, a little more nuanced perspective about some of these things. And the reason why I have a little more nuanced perspective is, is that's exactly what I thought Reese Olsen was before this year, if if that (laughs) so... I think anybody that watched Reese throw too much, you know, very much prior to this year, there was no possible way you thought he was a starter. I mean, just he couldn't, he got no swings and misses on his fastball. And, you know, his breaking ball, which was tremendous, never landed it for a called strike. So, 
yeah, hitters would swing at it in the minor leagues. I worried they wouldn't swing at it in the major leagues. And the product that you saw once they brought him up here and polished him and changed a few, you know, they didn't change a few things. They changed a lot of things. All of a sudden, he had command, had command of a fastball, both sides of the plate, tweaked his breaking ball, and, you know, actually reduced the use of his changeup, which was one of his best pitches, and I'm sure we'll see it a lot more next year. And the, and the evolution was continuous throughout the year to where he was really, really good in his last six starts. So, you know, before I, you know, write off the idea that Wilmer Flores is going to be a reliever, because we both think that's what he's going to be. I think we need to see what the boys do with him before that. So, isn't that fun though? Isn't that fun? Like you, you can you can look at a player like a Reese Olsen or Wilmer Flores, and you can say, "Yeah, but wait until Robin Lund and Chris Fetter get their hands on him." That's exciting. That that's that's a really big deal. It's a really big deal, and it's why I think that. We'll get to this later, but in looking at a couple of really high-end free agent starters who, if they were healthy and throwing well, would get a lot of money, that signing with the Tigers is a possible destination because, you know, some of those guys need exactly what we just discussed. So it would be worth a lot of money, you know, nine-figure money if that occurred for them. So for sure, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that later. You know, as far as Dylan, hey Mark real quick too. Yeah. Dylan Dingler. I know. I mean, I want to kind of give you my thoughts too, is like, this is a guy that I'm wondering, Mark, does this guy ever break through? Like, is he ever going to be an actual big league catcher? And he's 25 catchers take some time to develop. We all know that. But when I look at his profile, I wonder, right? Like he's an athletic catcher. You know, he's been praised for his defense. I don't know if he's been praised for his defense more because of the fact that his offense has been so lackluster, but that's kind of where the emphasis is being placed on because, you know, he's not that guy that is hitting, you know, 250, right? 260. Now I know he hit 250, but again, you go and look at what he did in AAA, hit 202 with three homers, eight walks and 34 strikeouts in 26 games. Sure, he hit, you know, 256, but that was also with 12 games in low A Lakeland that benefited him greatly. But my question is, is like, do you think that this guy can actually be a number one catcher? Because I think he's athletic enough to do so. Again, everything I've heard about the defense has been good that, you know, pitchers like it when he's calling their games, those kind of things. But on offense, like he just really struggles with in zone swing and miss. He has above average plate discipline, but he just swings and misses too much inside the strike zone. And, and that's a real problem for me. He hit 16 home runs in his 89 games last year. Again, that's 12 games in low A Lakeland coming back from a right knee, you know, thing that he had. And then 51 games in double A Erie and then 26 games in triple A Toledo. 16 home runs. I like the pop. He has it. The question is, is the batting average and are the end zone whiffs ever going to decrease enough where he's making enough contact to really be an established number one guy? Or do you think that maybe he's just more of a, you know, number two who can provide some pop? Well, I think this is a big year coming up for him. You know, he's had a lot of trouble staying healthy, which is a big part of, you know, improving your skill set. I mean, Dylan Dingler, from a pure skill standpoint, is quite Phenomenal. good. Quite good. Really, really talented athlete. Played center field at Ohio State when he wasn't catching. That's how good of an athlete he is. Not small. Great arm. Has power. Will walk a little bit from time to time, kind of streaky as a hitter. And but I'm I'm a big believer in this about catchers. Really, really good ones. One of two things happens. They're, they're either really, really good when they're young, okay, and that happens rarely, but it does happen, or they take a long time. So catchers being 26, 27, 28 years old before they polish their skill set enough to be in the major leagues is pretty common. And I would say there's a pretty good chance, you know, Dingler's going to get 400, 450 at bats in AAA this year. What you, bring, sure. what you bring up about a lot of swing and miss in the zone is concerning. But, you know, as time goes on, especially when you have skills, Dylan Dingler was sort of like that at Ohio State. His first two years, he was kind of frustrating. More talent than product, you know, than productive. And I think when he was a junior, he 
was off the chain and he got drafted high. And that's why the Tigers picked up the team option for Carson Kelly, right? It's going to be Jake Rogers, Carson Kelly. Dylan Dingler is going to get his time in AAA Toledo. There's going to be no pressure for him to make a debut. It's not going to be this expected thing for him coming out of spring training. Like for anybody that thinks that Dylan Dingler has any chance of making the Tigers out of spring training, that's just not going to happen. And I think that also could be a reason why they left Donnie Sands on the 40-man roster. We'll see if that changes as the offseason goes along. But if you do get into a pinch and you do need a catcher to come up and, and take a spot, even if it's for two weeks, three weeks, I think they would much rather call up a guy like Donnie Sands, who's more polished at the AAA level. Now, not as good. I'm not saying that, that Donnie Sands is comparable to Dylan Dingler, but from a maturity standpoint, from already being there for a year, like he's just got more experience and he'd be ready to step in and, and fill in. So maybe that's why the Tigers are rolling with, you know, four catchers on the 40 man roster. We'll see if it changes, but it's interesting. And it's, it's something to monitor for sure. Yeah. Like I said, Dingler has skills. They have time and money invested in him. He's now at AAA. He is at least for now healthy. And I think we'll learn a lot more about the future outcomes of Dylan Dingler next season. I'm not too concerned at how old he is. I think catchers, like I said, develop typically kind of slowly. So let's talk about a couple other things. There were some non-tenders. I was saving this for today, but I think if you go back and check, the day they optioned one Spencer Turnbull to the minor leagues, I tweeted that will be the last inning he ever throws for the Detroit Tigers. And son of a bitch, it was, okay? Spencer Turnbull never threw another pitch for the Detroit Tigers. And you I, want me to tell you you were right. I'll tell you, Mark, you were right. I, I, you don't have to tell me. I'm just, you know, I'm old you know and right. hang up. I'm old and hang up by myself a lot. I just, I'm happy I was right and I don't need anyone to tell me. Okay. But anybody that is trying to explain to themselves about what a huge disappointment and loss Spencer Turnbull is, I think I summed it up for him yesterday, which is Spencer Turnbull has pitched one pretty full season in the major leagues in his career through 148 innings. That season, he was 3-17. and It's just so so we know. I think in the last three years, he's thrown less than 100 innings. He was so bad last year when they gave him basically carte blanche to be a member of the rotation that they finally just had to go, you got to go. You, you, we just, we got to option you. I know you're 30, you know, getting optioned to AAA at 30 years old after parts of five seasons in the major leagues. And no hitter. And yeah, well, there's been, you know, I think Carson Fulmer threw a no hitter. What's he doing now? (laughs) Good question. Right. So, you know, just because you throw a no hitter, that's one day. I don't care what you do one day. I care what you do 182 days. So, you know, my answer to you is, when is Spencer Turnbull, besides maybe for a month, three years ago, before he ended up having TJ, when has he ever been good? Really? I'm no, serious. I think I, I think that's a fair point. And I think it goes into, you know, the decisions that were made, right? And, and to kind of dig into the tender, non-tender and how that stuff works, that was on Friday and the Tigers had to make decisions on arbitration eligible players. And there were a handful of them they had to decide on. They decided to part ways with Austin Meadows and Spencer Turnbull, right? As we're talking about, they decided to tender contracts to Tarek Skubal, Casey Mize, Jake Rogers, and Akil Badu. So we got four players who are staying on the 40-man roster, two players who were removed from the 40-man roster. The Tigers also, also non-tendered three pre-arbitration players. And that's a little bit different. I'm going to quickly touch on them, but it's Brennan Hanafi, Freddie Pacheco, and Garrett Hill. I believe the Tigers are working to re-sign all of those players on minor league deals. Freddie Pacheco obviously has been rehabbing from Tommy John with the Tigers. Garrett Hill is somebody that the Tigers have talked about bringing back on a minor league deal. And then Hanafi, haven't heard a ton about him, but that's somebody that I know they wanted to bring in. Scott Harris brought him in last offseason. I'd be shocked if they didn't bring him back on a minor league deal. So Hanafi and Pacheco, they were both DFA'd back when the 40-man roster decisions were made with 
Wilmer Flores and Dylan Dingler. So they were basically in this like DFA limbo for a few days. Then they were non-tendered. By being non-tendered, they became free agents. The Tigers are kind of like negotiating with them as that kind of happens and, and hoping to bring those guys back. But aside from those three pre-arbitration players, the arbitration players, that was Austin Meadows, Spencer Turnbull, Tarek Skubal, Casey Mize, Jake Rogers, and Akil Badu. The way that that whole process works just to catch people up is the Tigers said, okay, yep, we're going to give contracts to four players. That's Skubal, Mize, Rogers, and Badu. Now, that doesn't mean that salaries are locked in for the 2024 season for those players, but tendering contracts to them, that's the first step in the arbitration process. Now, arbitration-eligible players with tendered contracts, they have until January 12th to negotiate salaries with the Tigers. If the two sides can't agree on that day, then an arbitration hearing is scheduled for February, and basically a panel of arbiters decides who wins the case, the Tigers' side or you know, the player side, right? So they each basically give two salaries that they believe that, you know, they're deserving of. And they try to come to an agreement and they can negotiate on that. If not, then basically each side submits and then the panel of arbiters says, okay, either this side wins or, you know, the other side wins. That happened with Michael Fulmer a while back, but it's, it's pretty rare in the Tigers case. We haven't seen that a ton from them historically. So that's how that whole process works. Basically, you become an arbitration eligible player after three years of service time. Or if you're like Akil Badu, you are you qualify for Super 2 status. And then by the time you hit six years of service time, you become a free agent. So that's a quick little explainer on it. But now that the Tigers have said, okay, we're going to give contracts, there are estimations out there. Scooble projected for $2.6 million. Jake Rogers projected for $2 million. Akil Badu projected for $1.7 million. And Casey Mize projected for $1.2 million. But the big one, the big surprise was Turnbull, I thought. And, and I think that's important to discuss is everybody knew the Tigers were going to part ways with Austin Meadows. I was told the restricted list, there was no way that was happening. I've been told recently now that like Austin Meadows isn't even decided on if he wants to continue his playing career. So a minor league deal, well, sure, like that could happen maybe down the road to keep him in the same organization as his brother, give him a chance to play with his brother. I'm sure that's something that, you know, those two have always dreamed of doing, right? Like, like I, I can't even imagine, you know, what that's like. To have, to have that opportunity, right? And so I think that might that window could still be open, but as of right now, Austin Meadows is undecided on if he even wants to continue his playing career. And he's missed most of the last two seasons dealing with anxiety and, and being on the injured list. Obviously, we wish him the best, but there's just still so much up in the air. Therefore, I think the big surprise was Turnbull, especially because at the end of the season, Scott Harris came out and said that they expect Turnbull to go through his offseason program, be ready to go, come to Lakeland, compete for a spot in the starting rotation. And that was early October. And here we are now in mid-November and he gone. Well, I think, and you can verify this for me. And I, obviously, you know, Scott is a pretty, you know, he's a president of baseball operations. I mean, you know, he offered them all around the league. And it's not for sure. Like, at, it's, the trade, at the trade deadline too. I mean, Spencer and, Turnbull requested a trade at the deadline. Scott Harris tried to move him and there were no takers. Mm -hmm. And then and, again, at the, the tender, non-tender deadline. Correct. So I, I just want to clarify that for all of you Twitter GMs out there, they tried to trade him. Nobody wanted him. They didn't want to pay him $1.7 million or $2 million because it's somewhere in that range. His ARB value and, you know, somebody's going to sign Spencer Turnbull, I promise you, and they'll think they'll rehab him and God bless him. But yeah, he's going to be 31. He's 31 years old and, you know, there's... Hey, Mark. Go ahead. It was $2.4 million. Excuse me. I don't think anybody in their right mind is paying Spencer Turnbull $2.4 million. There you so, go. All right. So the way I look at these things, the, the way I like to explain them is I want you to drive to a large car junkyard and I want you to get out of your car and look at it or heck, even drive in it and look around everywhere. At one point in time, Every single one of those cars was new and clean and beautiful, okay? And that's kind of how I look at Spencer Turnbull or lots of, you know, pitchers. They were all clean and beautiful and healthy and full of potential at one point in time. And now there's just a junkyard littered with them everywhere. So there's a lot of Spencer Turnbulls on the market these days and I understand why the Tigers did not want to 
be in the Spencer Turnbull business. All right, we're coming up to the first break. We're going to take it. We'll be back in a minute. All right, we're back. I just wanted to touch for a second on Freddie Pacheco because Freddie Pacheco uh, is pretty damn interesting when he's healthy. Nasty slider. Nasty. Fastball sits 96, 98. And, you know, to be really blunt about it, every team has quite a few relievers with that power profile, except the Tigers, who have... Not, not a lot of relievers with, you know, a 96, 98, up to 100 fastball besides Jason Foley. So, you know, the Tigers could use somebody like that. I do hope that they are able to work a deal out with him to keep him and maybe we see him by the end of the year. Well, I, I don't, Mark, I don't think you take him off the 40 man roster unless you have a deal ready to go for him and, and he's ready to resign. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see that within the next few days. I mean, this is a guy that the Tigers went out and got. They put on their 40-man roster. They initiated Tommy John. They went through the beginning stages of rehab. This was a shrewd move by Scott Harris to sneak him through right now. I mean, again, if you were to take him off the 40-man roster at the end of the season, let's just say, there's a chance he gets picked up on waivers, right? This was a perfect time where he could be in DFA limbo. Then you could non-tender him. Then you could re-sign to that minor league contract. Bring him in. He's not clogging up a spot in the 40-man it's it's a perfect situation. And now it worked so well for them last year because, or last season, because they were able to put him on the 60-day injury list and he didn't even take up a spot on the 40-man, right? So it was perfect. Now you're in a situation where you probably need that that 40-man spot, especially during the offseason when you're trying to make moves, make additions, whether it's via trade or free agency or Rule 5 draft. And I think it's a perfect time to make the move. I think they did it right. And I would not be shocked to see Freddie Pacheco back. You're spot on, man. He, he's nasty when he's right. The slider is so good. The fastball, it's really fast. And I've heard a lot of good things about the way that he pitches and the way that he can dice up hitters. It's just for him. It's just getting healthy coming back from TJ. And the good thing is it's not a shoulder injury, right? This is, this right. is Tommy John. We've seen pitchers come back from it. You know, sure, maybe there might be some command issues, but at the same time, velocity is not an issue coming off of Tommy John. We've seen yeah. that time and time again. Yeah, you, plus you have a lot of control. He was on the verge of oh yeah, starting to break through to be a major league reliever. So, you know, I'm hoping they retain him. As far as Garrett Hill, not one of my personal favorites, but as a depth, you depth. know, as a as a you know, minor league system depth arm, probably pretty decent. Did not have a great year this year, much better in 2022, or at least showed more. So we'll we'll see how that works out. Obviously, the team and the player always have to agree to those things. Now, we we wanted to, but did not talk about the Tyler Alexander pickup by Tampa Bay. You know, look, I, I said when we discussed the 40, you know, last month that I thought that he was likely not to be tendered a contract or kept on the 40. People were upset about it. Yeah, he had a pretty decent year last year. But, and he's, you know, a clubhouse present, that's for sure. Pretty big part mm-hmm. of the mix as a teammate. But, you know, he's a, you know, he's a pretty fringy 11th, 12th, 13th guy on a staff. Doesn't have a ton of upside. Doesn't strike out a ton of guys. And, you know, he's a fill-in guy. He's going to give you 60 innings of one more or less type of contribution. Yes, Tampa took him, but to be really blunt about it, he's a Tampa Bay kind of guy. They're great about optimizing pitch mix. I'm not so sure what they see that, you know, Fetter London Nieves didn't already see, but you but know, doesn't doesn't that worry you a little bit though? I nah. mean, that, that's kind of why that's kind of why I wanted to bring this up is like, you know, we had we had talked about the Tigers' decision to designate him for assignment that happened a while back before the GM meetings, and at the GM meetings, you know, Scott Harris had said that the Tigers had interest in bringing him back. It was kind of a hey, let's see how the waiver process goes. If he goes unclaimed, then we're going to try to work out a deal with him and and bring him back. And that wouldn't have been a minor league deal, I'll tell you that much. It, it would have been a minor league deal maybe if it would have been beginning of February and he had no options and, and needed to you know turn to the Tigers, right? But he was looking for a big league deal out on the market. And who knows, the Tigers would have rekindled that and, and tried to bring him back, you know, at a cheaper rate than he was projected to get. But 
the same thing is, I mean, the, the, the situation is that, you know, he had a partial tear of the lab muscle in early July. Tigers put him on the injured list. He didn't need surgery. He was able to rehabilitate, but he missed the rest of the season after that. Now, he did complete a 25-pitch live batting practice session November 3rd in Lakeland. That was three days before the Tigers removed him from their 40-man roster. It was his final session facing hitters. He was able to jump into his normal off-season training program in Fort Worth, Texas. He appears to be healthy. The Tigers then cut him, and the Rays pick him up. And when the Rays pick up pitchers, those flashing lights kind of go on, and, and, and you're kind of on high alert as to, oh, maybe they see something good. And you go back and you look at what Alexander did last year was – this guy, 1.02 walks per nine innings. That ranked third among 140 pitchers with at least 40 innings. He struggled giving up home runs. He gave up too many hits. But at the same time, the underlying metrics were good with a 3.66 expected ERA compared to his 4.50 ERA. There's a lot of, there's a lot to like about him, right? Like he's a guy that had a spot in the Tigers bullpen for a really long time for a reason. It's because he throws strikes in the fastball is is nothing to write home about. I mean, again, this is a guy who throws 89, 90, 91 sometimes. The Tigers had asked him to try to take his velocity up into that 92 range. He wasn't able to do it, but the command was still pretty pinpoint. He was looking for maybe $2 million in the uh, arbitration process, which would have been you know just a slight raise from his $1.875 million salary in 2023. And then the Rays decided to obviously tender him a contract. He's going to be with them and on their roster, like... I don't know. Does does that concern you at all? That maybe they see something that the Tigers didn't see. And I'm not trying to say that the Tigers didn't see something with Isak Paredes, who I think is important to mention because AJ Hinch and the coaching staff there had told him repeatedly, pull the ball, pull the ball, pull the ball. So I'm not saying that maybe it's something that, you know, Chris Fetter and Robin Lund don't see, but is there a way in which the Rays feel like they can optimize them, a process that they can put him through that maybe the Tigers you know, we're not able to do, or do you think this is just, Hey, let's take a flyer on a guy. He kind of fits our profile. We'll see if we have anything here. Look, you know, baseball players are like real estate. Everybody has their thing that they like. All right. But just because you like it doesn't mean someone else likes it. That's so fair. I'll, I'll pose the question to you like this. Where, where did, you know, where the Tigers rank in major league ERA post all-star break you know oh they were up there man like top they, five yeah top five so and was tyler alexander on the roster then he was not okay so you know my answer is i only worry about what we're doing it's not like he was such a huge impactful piece so if tampa feels that he can help them he, god bless him well, you know, I think the Tigers have proven they know how to develop pitching. They know how to look for That's pitching. True. They have their own ways and methods and can't worry about who's not here, only can worry about who is here. So if their pitching had ranked 27th, I would be a little more concerned about it. They were in the top five. I think they were second, to be really honest with you. And, you know, so, yeah, Tyler Alexander... He had a good five years here. And as far as the fable of Tampa Bay, you know, touching you and uh, you turning into an angel. Well, you know, I can quickly pull up as I did like a month ago when we had this or three weeks ago. when We had this discussion that I don't have right in front of me, but I listed off about four or five guys who were good for 10 minutes once they got to Tampa Bay. And then in year two, they got shuffled off to nowhere. So. Yes, they have their success stories. Every team has their success stories when they take, you know, when they acquire pitchers and try to optimize them. So, you know, good for Tyler. I'm glad he went to a really good team. I think they'll do good things with him. He was a really good guy here. Do I think it changes the win-loss dynamic? Not one iota. So, yeah, onward. Let's go forward. Time to add some new blood. Not too worried about losing Tyler Alexander. That's my attitude. All right. You wrote a really great piece this week that I hope people read. And if not, I want you to go to the Freep and take a look. But, you know, we've talked a lot about Javi Baez. We've been pretty blunt about it. Heck, we talked to Castellani last week about it. But you found out a few things. There's a few things that we need people to listen to and understand. 
and you have some information, why don't you share what he's going to do different this offseason that he's never done before? Yeah, a lot of differences in Javi Baez's offseason program, which I think first and foremost is huge. I think that's that's big in and of itself, right? When somebody is willing to change, I think that says everything about him. I mean, after year one of Javier Baez, I think there was a lot of maybe he wasn't feeling as comfortable as he hoped he was going to feel and, you know, could point the fingers elsewhere and not say that he was doing it in a rude way, but it was like, you know, Hey, you know, maybe this just isn't me. Maybe something's going on here. And you know what, like, I just got to be better next year and it's, it's going to be fine. And, you know, the Tigers did a lot of things, not only for Javi Baez, but for other players as well. And, and also to attract free agents in the way in which they went about their upgrades. Right. I mean, they, they made a lot of changes and did a lot of things in the clubhouse you know, with a brand new kitchen in there, new outfield dimensions, right? Like new team playing, like all these different things that they did. Obviously, you know, were for the players as a whole, but also really gave Javi Baez comfort. And I think that that was something that was really important to him as a player, as a superstar player who has played in Chicago and New York. And I'm not trying to make him out to be a diva because I don't think that's how he, how he operates. But at the same time, when you're in the Cubs organization, you're in the Mets organization, then you come to the Tigers under, you know, former general manager Al Avila, and it's not this first class experience that, you know, you had been shown other places. I think that that is something that's worth noting, right? Obviously, though, didn't play well or as well, right, as he he should have played. And then year two happens. And it's like when year two happens, there's really no one to point the finger at but yourself. And I think he has realized that. And I think that has kind of gotten to him in the sense where he's ready to attack this offseason. And everything that I've heard is that he's super motivated to get back and be better. And there's a plan in place. So the plan in place for starters is to buy a house in Tampa. He took care of that. So he bought a house in Tampa. He's going to be, you know, between both Tampa and Puerto Rico. In the past, he had been going to Puerto Rico and he would hang out there. And he has a really sweet, like, you know, basically a mountaintop ranch. And it's absolutely beautiful. Lots of toys, lots of gadgets, a beautiful batting cage that overlooks, you know, the side of the mountain and goes out. I mean, it's gorgeous. He, he showed me videos before and, and some photos. But now he's going to be splitting time between Tampa and Puerto Rico as opposed to just being in one place. I mean, that's really big. I mean, that is really, really important for him to be here where he can be around different hitting guys. He can be with a new trainer that he's hired. He can work out in a place where the Tigers can easily access him, both by sending him videos back and forth, communicating with the hitting coaches, and then also having the hitting coaches go to Tampa and visit him as opposed to having to make that trip all the way to Puerto Rico. That's just not that's just not really the way to do it, right? To get him into a real facility and to be put in work all off season, that's step one. Now, the real plan is strengthening his back and core muscles to accommodate for his swing as he continues to age, and then making the swing changes that are necessary to recapture his ability to create damage despite that free swinging style. Okay, so it's the back and the core muscles because again, when the guys you watch him swing, right? It's a violent swing over and over and over again. And we even saw him at times last year, he would swing and then he would like put his arm up and he would stretch like his back was tight. And it's because those muscles aren't as strong as they are, right? He can't just rely on the natural ability to swing hard and make something happen. He's not getting the same power behind it. The bat speed is still there. His bat speed was above average last year. I think it actually ranked somewhere around like the 85th percentile, which isn't what he used to be sure. But at the same time, that's still very much above average and very much workable. But again, there's not the same strength and power behind it because it's continued to age. Now, the violent swing that he has has kind of forced that age to happen quicker, right? Like he's entering his age 31 season, but maybe it's more like it's age 33 or 34 season. Because of the way that he's played, the way that he's swung, and the way that he's relied on his natural abilities his entire career. So that's the process, right? He's going to be strengthening the back and the core muscles and then making some swing changes to recapture his ability to do damage. And that, that's what it's going to come down to. And I, I think it, a lot of that comes down to getting his timing right. And, you know, maybe some of that could be swing plane to get his bat staying in the zone for longer. And again, when you swing so violently, you pull your head out and you're not able to see the ball. So I, I do think that it's fixable. And I think that people, what really frustrates me, Mark, is that people that, you know, are on Twitter and they read my story and they say, oh, well, you know, he needs an eye doctor visit. He needs to go and he needs to get his eyes checked because he keeps swinging at pitches that are outside of the zone. I don't think people realize that in 2018, Javi Baez hit 34 home runs and also hit 290 while swinging at sliders down and away a ton. He's gonna I don't think they realize that in 20. Yeah. I don't think they realize that in 2019, he hit 29 home runs. He also hit 281. He swung at sliders outside of the zone 
all the time. You want to go and look what you did with the New York Mets when he hit 299 with nine home runs in 47 games at the trade deadline, also swung at sliders all the time. This isn't a sliders problem for him. It's getting back on the fastball, fixing the timing, and that's what it's going to come down to. Now, the plan as of now, and this still has to happen, this still has to be scheduled, is he's going to go see Aaron Judge's hitting guy, who also works with Kerry Carpenter. And he teaches this concept of launch quickness, which is basically this rearward, rearward move of the bat and then a snap of the hands. He's transformed the career of Aaron Judge. He, he helped create what Aaron Judge is. He's also made Kerry Carpenter what Kerry Carpenter is. And these are things that Javier Baez already does, which I think is important, right? He already implements a lot of the techniques and the movements that he teaches, but the movements are just so big that they cause timing issues. So it's quieting the swing a little bit, maybe changing that swing path, getting on time for fastballs. That can make a whole world of a difference, but it has nothing to do with sliders. None of this has anything to do with sliders. And I'm so tired of hearing people on Twitter talk about how it's all about the sliders. It has nothing to do with them. If Javier Baez was hitting 25 home runs and he was hitting 260, nobody would care about him swinging and missing at the sliders because he's done that his entire career and that's never going to change. He's not going to draw walks. He's not going to lay off those pitches. It's about getting him back on time for fastballs in the zone. And then also doing damage on mistake pitches, right? That That's what made Javi Baez so good when he was in his prime and when he was playing so well was he was able to not only hit mistakes in the zone and fastballs in the zone, but he was able to hit mistakes outside of the zone and fastballs outside of the zone. In the shadow zone, as they call it, which is a little bit in the strike zone, but also a little bit outside of the strike zone too. He would do damage on those pitches. That's why he was so unpitchable because he could hit anything in any spot. And so like, I understand everyone wants to talk about the sliders, but... It, it has nothing to do with the sliders. That, yeah. That's my rant. I'm done. Well, and it's a good rant because, you know, people often can only comment on what they're seeing. But when you look at the numbers for Javi Baez, the bottom line is he used to crush fastballs and he crushed mistake breaking pitches in the zone. Last year, he crushed nothing. I mean, literally nothing. And it's funny because you sent me a video clip <laughs> the other day. And it was, I think, the first homer he hit as a Tiger. Indeed, and, against the Red Sox. Indeed. And where, where, what pitch was it? And where was that pitch located? Fastball, out of the zone. Uh, like, like at the neck, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, that 85% of major league pitchers, 85% of major league hitters don't even swing at, okay? or much less hit it. He absolutely jumped it and just hit an, a bomb to and dead that's left field. part of what field. made him great when he was you know, with is, the Cubs and then with the Mets. It's signature Javi Baez right there. Like Other players can't do that, and that's what sets him apart. And that, that's why I think that you know the whole swinging out of the zone thing, it's just people need to stop. People need to stop worrying about that because that's, that's always been part of his game. Right. You're worrying about the wrong thing. Exactly. And another thing too, Mark, real quick, I want to mention this and I want to get your take on it because I think that this can be overblown sometimes, but if the Tigers get off to a hot start last year or this season, excuse me, and Javier Baez does everything that he's supposed to do in the off season, he grinds and he puts in the work because that it's, it's all a plan right now, right? You got to execute the plan. Okay. You can say you're going to do a bunch of things, but then to actually go out and do them and do them for three weeks is one thing to do them for a month and a half is another thing to do them for three months before spring training. That's a totally other thing, right? But do you think Javi Baez is the kind of player where if the Tigers get off to a fast start, if he's able to implement all these different things, if you know the crowd shows up and there is that atmosphere, is he the kind of player that could like have a career worst year and then turn it around and have not a career best year, but to turn it around and maybe have the best year of this given contract coming off of the worst year of this given contract? Like He just seems like one of those players that could do that. Like just, just based on the pure athletic ability, the hand eye coordination, right? Like there are so many intangibles that he has. And then if he's able to work on some of these other things and the tires are good, I see that as almost a perfect blend for him. I'm not trying to get too excited, but there seems to be a lot of good things. I think our expectations of Javi at this point in time are pretty reasonable. I mean, if you hit 245 with 20 bombs, he's a three war player and a pretty solid contributor. I mean, if Javi Baez is hitting 6-7 and hits 20 homers, that's going to be pretty effective. 
Now, could he be better than that? Well, he used to be. I mean, so why not? Lots of guys have had, you know, career resurgences. But at the same time, you know, to summarize, moving to Tampa, changing his workout program, going to a new hitting coach. So for all of you that think he doesn't care and wanted to cut him and, you know, look, Mark Gorosh never has a problem calling people out or telling you about a player that he doesn't think is good. I think that if you don't think that Javi Baez has the possibility of being a pretty solid, if not major contributor to the Detroit Tigers, and he's taking steps to address what 31-year-old Javi Baez is as opposed to 23-year-old Javi Baez, then you're not really paying attention. You're not dealing with reality. So let's hope that some of these steps have an impact in a positive way and we'll take it under advisement. You know, I think it's important to understand Javi Baez is playing shortstop for the Detroit Tigers unless just an absolute meltdown worse than last year happens. So if I were you and you want the Tigers to be good, there's no player that has more upside relative to how he played uh, than Javi Baez does and can have an impact on W's for the Detroit Tigers. All right. All right. We're going to take our last break. We'll be back in a minute. we got a few more things to discuss. All right. We're back. We got, I asked for a few mailbag questions. We're going to do a couple real quick. Stan Wondolowski asked, who gets traded, Malloy or Bigby? You got a thought about that? None. Neither. All right. I would say that it's not impossible that Justin Henry Malloy could get done. Oh, no. Wrong. I disagree. I'm so done having this conversation, though. It was the same J.D. Martinez or Justin Henry Malloy, and now it's it's not going to be J.D. Martinez. It's going to be, is Malloy going to get traded? There's no chance the Tigers are trading Justin Henry Malloy. If they do, I'll come back. I'll eat all my words. Like I will apologize to every listener for being so wrong on this, but I think there's no way that Malloy gets traded. If there really were going to be a debate, though, like maybe Justice Bigby, only because of the fact that he has this breakthrough minor league season, and I think there are some things that you can evaluate about his game that maybe the Tigers look at and they don't like. I don't really know if he's this next Kerry Carpenter. I think that that's a little bit overblown. So maybe you could get a team to buy into the fact that Justice Bigby is the next big thing and make a move because you do have a lot of outfield depth. But at the same time, I like enough of what I've seen from him that I think it's important that he continues to get at bats and is a part of the Tigers and is with the organization because, you know, if he does pop and and he continues to mature and he continues to grow and he continues to take these steps forward, I think that could be a really big thing. I mean, if he can get into the pull side power, that that's going to be really impressive and that could really take him to the next level. So, yeah, I think they keep them both. I, I don't think they try to either of those players. I, I think Bigby's now put himself on the map. People are paying attention. Still has some steps to take. This will be a big year for him. All right, next question. My boy Steve Cook at Slap Happy Cookie on Twitter uh, sends us a picture every day of how beautiful it looks at nine in Jefferson when the sun's rising. Really good guy. Pretty active. Asks, will the team really have Matt Veerling start and play at third base every day. He doesn't think you can. What's the chance that Paul Keith may play a few games there besides second base? That's a good question. What do you think? Yeah, I don't want to speak too soon because there's so much offseason to go. And obviously the Tigers have talked a lot about trying to, you know, make smart baseball decisions whenever they can, right? And so if a smart baseball decision presents itself and there is a chance to have an upgrade at third base, I think they probably go for it. But I don't see that being like a priority for them. I think it's going to be the combination of Matt Veerling, Colt Keith and Andy Abanez holding down second base and third base. I think that's pretty, I think their infield's pretty much set with Torkelson, Colt Keith, Javi Baez, Matt Veerling, Andy Abanez working his way in there as well. So I, I think it's a combination of both those things. Andy Abanez obviously looked really, really sharp at second base last season. He can also play third base. You got Matt Veerling, 
Obviously, he's going to play more infield than outfield because the Tigers went out and got Mark Canna. That obviously moves him to third base more often than outfield. That's why they made that shift when they did last year was to prepare him for a heavier workload at third base. And then Colt Keith, yes, while he can play third base, the Tigers probably want to keep him at second base because of the shoulder injury that he had. I think that's smart. I think that's wise. Could he bounce over there and play? For sure. If the Tigers wanted to play Colt Keith and Andy Abanez, and Andy Abanez fits you better at second base in that situation, and Colt Keith fits you better at third base, I think they're going to go ahead and do it. I don't think Colt Keith's going to be this everyday third base, and I think he's going to play more second base than anything. So to answer the question, yes, I do think the Tigers will really have Matt Beerling start and play at third base almost every day. Uh, I think it's going to be a combination. These guys are going to mix in, but I think we're going to see a lot of Matt Veerling at third base until he shows that either he can take on that job every day and maybe he gets into more of that power, which the Phillies were not able to pull out of him and the Tigers also were not able to pull out of him so far, at least. So yeah, Matt Veerling is probably going to be your almost everyday third baseman with some mix of Andy Abanez and also Andy Abanez mixing in at second base as well. There's still a lot of offseason left though, like I said, so things could change, but that's how I see it now. Love it or hate it, Matt Veerling's probably your third baseman. Yeah, if they need me to, I'll call Richard Shank myself and see if we can get a group discount. Maybe we should send Matt Veerling there too. <laughs> If Matt Beerling um, could just get into the power, man, that's that. But again, like that, that does, that causes me concern, right? Like if Kevin Long from the Phillies wasn't able to do it. And if the Tigers weren't able to do it in year one, I'm not really optimistic that suddenly Matt Beerling is going to be able to start, you know, hitting for power that, which he's like never done before in his career. So never say never, but say never. All right. Last question. My buddy field diamond. He uh, wanted to know, We've discussed many times that in the sports writer community that Evan Petzl, without doubt, has the best, you know, hair in the business. The flow is, you know, truly like an Argentinian, you know, fashion model. So he wanted to know, does Evan use a comb or a brush? All right, Mark. Interesting question. I was not expecting that one. Yeah. So I use a brush. I also use my hands. I also use like some paste and some gel and it's kind of a a mixed combo that I throw together. I also use the blow dryer from time to time. It's a step-by-step process that also changes as my hair grows. Right now I'm starting to kind of grow it back. I I used to have long hair and I love my long hair. And then I got it cut and I really liked the short hair. I thought it looked more professional on me, but we're in the off season right now. I'm kind of growing it back out. It's getting cold outside. I like to go on walks. It keeps the ears warm. You know how that goes. So yeah, it's a brush. It's also kind of using my hands and getting it to part down the middle and and down the sides. Use the combination of like this paste and this gel and I mix them together. So yeah, there's a step-by-step process. You got to condition it, you know, at least a couple of times a week and obviously shampooing it every day is the way to go. That's how I've always done it, at least. So, yeah, that's kind of the the four one zero on my hair. Well, what's what's Savannah Petzold have to say about about the hair care in products? I don't know. She's kind of a little bit indifferent on it, I guess. Like there are times where she really likes my long hair. She also likes it when I have my short hair. Now, she used to hate the haircuts that I got when I was in like early in college back in high school, like hated them because I would always get my hair cut short. I never grew my hair out long. Like I have it, like I have recently. And I would just get these terrible like box cuts on my head. Like if, whenever I hand people my ID, like if I'm going somewhere and I got to show them my ID, like sometimes they'll like, look at it, look at it again. I'm like, my hair's a lot better now, isn't it? And they're like, yeah, for sure. Because my hair was terrible in high school and in college. So she was not a fan of that. So I think anything other than what I had been, she loves. So she's been very happy with me since like junior year of college. If I had your hair, I would like go for the Jason Momoa look. I mean, you, you, you have just, you know, you have just outstanding flow. I, I'm never going to take it that long. I mean, that's, that, that's pretty insane. (laughs) That's man, that that's man bun length. I don't Uh, think I could, I could get it that long. I, I get it. So it was Savannah Petzold's birthday this week. So I want to know, where did you go for dinner? Yeah. So we went to dinner at Cooper's Hawk the day before her birthday. So that's a place that we both really like. I'm a big wine guy. So I do enjoy my wine. She does not drink wine, but she really likes the food at Cooper's Hawk. So anytime we can go to Cooper's Hawk, I'm like all in. So we went there. And then we also went to this place called Luciano's with her parents on the night of her birthday. So 
they wanted to get together. Her mom's birthday is actually the day after hers. So it's kind of a tradition that, you know, they get together and, and have a birthday dinner together on Savannah's birthday. So we did a, you know, first year husband, wife birthday dinner the night before. And then after that, went out with her parents at Luciano's, which Luciano's is great, by the way. Like if people haven't been there before, it's not in the Detroit area, but it is in Clinton Township. It's, I think it's 17 in Garfield, if I'm not mistaken. And it is, it is some elite Italian food. It is, it is so good. It's one of my favorite places to go. If you drive up to it, you're going to drive up to basically like this strip of, you know, there's like a pizza place. There's like a, I don't know. I think there's like a, like a place you can buy alcohol and all that kind of stuff. There might be like a flower shop in there. I think there's a Chinese place. And then like smack dab in the middle is Luciano's Italian restaurant. And it is so good. You would not think it's that good when you drive up, but it's, it's excellent. So if anyone can go check that out, if you're in the Clinton Township area, you're in the Macomb County area, go check it out. 17 and Garfield, Luciano's Italian restaurant. Really, really good. All right. Well, I'm glad you had a good time. I, I'll share that, you know, I've been known to love eating sushi quite a bit. And where I live in the 14 and Woodward area, I, of course, like to go to Noble Fish, which I think is one for best sushi restaurant. <laughs> barely a restaurant. It's more like a half store, half restaurant, mostly takeout. Uh, it's in Clawson, but in, you know, I like Ronan in Royal Oak a lot too, but I have a place around the block from my house called Edo Ramen, E-D-O Ramen. And I've kind of snuck in a few times and it started to win some awards. I stopped there on Saturday night. I've been known to like a soup called Nabiyaki Udon and it is quite fantastic. And I have to say, Ido Ramen, you did a great job. I was surprised. I actually make that soup myself and it's not, a, a lot of people make it, not many people make it well. And they did a really, really great job. So that's uh, my food recommendation for this week. And We'll start talking about a few things like that in the off season. We, I'm sure we got a few guests that we're going to work on here. It's Thanksgiving week. So everybody that's traveling want to just say travel safely. Hopefully you don't have to sleep in an airport, which has been seemingly at Christmas and Thanksgiving the last few years. People are not having the best travel experiences. If you're driving, drive safely. Hope you enjoy your family. Hope you don't discuss politics at dinner and after today's Lions game, which I think was pretty interesting, and I think Evan and I have said this many times, today's Lions game is a perfect example of what a good team does to a bad team, right? So, 100%. I mean, that was a statement win for me. I, I think that was a, and again, I don't want to get too much on the Lions, you know, I don't want to get too much into the Lions discussion because that's Dave Broquette's alley. Go to Freep.com, read him, read him, read him. He's so good at what well, he does. And Carlos but, and Carlos and Sean do pods. And Carlos and Sean too. I mean, the podcast that they do as well is 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 awesome. And, you know, Jeff Seidel, he writes about the, the, the Lions a ton. I mean, it's kind of all hands on deck this time of year for Lions coverage, and they all do such a great job. But yeah, I thought that this was a statement win for the Lions to be able to be down like that against the Chicago Bears in a, a game that was very clearly a trap game with Justin Fields coming back. And you're in a situation where you got to go out and win. you got to come back and win. And they were able to do it. Jared Goff looked so calm, cool, collected in that last drive. And you know what? He, he, I think he made himself some money. I really do. I think he got himself paid. I, I, hey. I hope the Lions bring him back. That's me watching as a fan, obviously. You know, for more on that, you probably got to go read Dave. He knows more about that than I do, but it, it's, it's impressive watching the way that he yeah. you know, really handles that offense. How about this? First time in NFL history, a team has given up four turnovers, allowed the other team to have 40 minutes in time of possession, and won the football game. The Lions had 20 minutes of time of possession and scored 28 points, 14 of them in the last three minutes. I've said this many times. I am 67 years old. They have never had a football team like this in my lifetime, you know, named the Detroit Lions. So, yeah, a lot of fun. And, you know, got a game Thursday play the Packers. Let's hope they can get another win and let's enjoy it while we can. All right. So hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. I want to thank our executive producers, 
Kirk Crawford and Anjanette Delgado. I'd like to thank the Free Press editor, Nicole Avery Nichols, also. You know, also. I'd like to thank my grandson, Braden Michael Gorash, who I had a nice talk with tonight. And hopefully everybody will have a great time with their family. And all I'd like to say to you is go in peace. Peace.